Okay, let's talk a little bit about patient and occupational dose. This is what I spent. I was up till midnight last night. I just submitted a paper to the ASRT on this very thing. So it should be fairly fresh in my mind. I'll try to go pretty close to what, what's important from our textbook. One thing that's very important, page 566, um, how we record patient dose is largely through an ESC or entrance skin exposure, um, bone marrow do dose, and a gonadal dose. Those are the three ways that we generally calculate patient dose or their exposure. And so it's important if you're working with a physicist and someone was misexamined, like say you, you did Mr. Jones's x-ray on Mrs. Smith and they've got to figure out, okay, what exactly was this person exposed, exposed to needlessly? They're going to need parameters from the machine and also what protocol you used because they're trying to calculate all these things because these are how we're going to figure out what kind of risk the person was exposed to. So here are some general uh, ideas of just what kinds of dose might be associated with what kinds of energy to what kinds of anatomy, right? And so you can see what's really interesting, like a skull x-ray. Um, no one has testicles in their skull, at least no um, life forms that we've found yet in this universe. So they're not going to have much of a dose to their gonads if we're x-raying their skull, right? Um, but that's what this chart is really trying to make us understand. Whereas with the chest x-ray, we're getting a little bit closer to the gonads, but any kind of, if a photon strikes the gonads after chest, it's probably actually an internal scatter event. So there's no way to shield for that. So the general rule about shielding, of course, comes from these kinds of things. But by the time you get down to the L-spine or the KUB, you are talking about a significant gonadal dose. Right? And so I'm looking at, uh, and then we could also look at what's interesting is entrance skin exposure, right? So this is the side that's facing the um, tube, right? It's going to get a significant skin exposure as all those photons bombard their skin, have attenuation vents inside the body, and then there'll be a decreased exposure on the back. There will still be exposure back here on the back, but it will be less, right? And so sometimes if we're, if we're thinking about, you know, we really want to shield a patient, their gonads for a KUB, we might do it PA, right? Because now most of the dose is going to be distributed over that entrance skin side. There'll be decreased dose on the side of the gonads, right? Um, so these are some of the considerations we have to think about. Now, when we compare it, for example, to CT, we see something totally different is going on in the world of CT, right? Because CT is answering that age-old question, what happens when we run, throw an x-ray tube around someone's body over and over and over again, right? And so the entrance skin exposure is going to be distributed around the entire surface of the body, right? Any area that the, the machine is spinning around, right? And we're using considerably more um, radiation, so we can actually measure um, doses like to the gonads uh, related to the head, expo a head radiation uh, or, um, but especially for CT pelvis, we're talking about a significant um, amount of exposure uh, to, to the gonads for those patients. Um, so that, that's what this chart is here for. It's to help us kind of think critically through um, what kinds of exposure would I, I anticipate to have related to the kind of anatomy I'm looking at. Now, fluoro, um, a lot of times we're just talking about um, calculating some kind of ESE because we're using a very, uh, we're using a smaller area, and we've got our tube much closer to the patient, right? And so the most significant dose on most fluoro examinations that we do, especially stuff in the OR and things like that, is probably going to be entrance skin exposure because again, fluoro, the fluoro machine, like we learned earlier, is using a lower, um, well, the film-based fluoro is using a lower um, KVP, right, to do what it's doing. So what do we do to reduce unnecessary patient dose? Here's a list that some of the things that the book came up with. Um, so number one, we just need a justification for why we're doing this. So hello, Mrs. Smith, how are you doing? Why are we doing this exam today? All right? That's a very important history for me to get from any patient before I give them a radiation exposure because once I've exposed them to radiation, I can't take it back. Right? Um, so once I push the button, I can't unpush that button. So why are we doing this exam? Is this the, is this the appropriate exam to be doing in this person's condition, right? And this is a critical thinking skill that's a patient-centered critical thinking skill. So this is an area, it's well within your scope of practice to figure out if we're doing the right exam for this person, 
right? Just don't, don't just mindlessly be a button pusher and go through your life just up, all right, breathe, beep, breathe, beep. Any monkey could do that. Like, it's, it's your job to figure out, okay, why the heck are we doing this, right? So um, there's no reason to do mass screenings for tuberculosis. That's a good example. There's no reason to do, uh, like, a chest X-ray for everyone who gets admitted to the hospital, right? Um, that's just, they're just basically just lying in their checkbooks. They're just, like, taking, the, taking that money to the bank, and that's signi- a considerable conflict of interest. Um, there's no reason to do x-rays related to pre-employment physicals, right? Um, there's no reason to do x-rays related to periodic health examinations. This is one of the reasons why I refuse to do x-rays at the dentist, right? It's a periodic health ex- examination. You don't need to do x-rays on me. Um, you're just trying, again, just taking that money straight to the bay. There does not, not every person who goes to the emergency department <laughs> needs a CT scan. Now, you can tell the doctors that all day long, but... So somehow or other, we, they've missed the, uh, the memo on that. But, um, but that is something that we're questioning quite a bit now. Um, and then, of course, the big one for us is repeat examinations down here. And the book says something interesting on page, I think it's 574. It says 573 in the little penguin box. It should never be necessary to repeat a digital radiographic examination. So the reasons why we might need to change or repeat an x-ray is because of technique and positioning. But one of the things that we can do consistently, and this gets to what Allie was saying, is there's a a sociological phenomena that's occurring in x-ray right now. And it looks a little bit like this. I'm going to say this off the record. So, um, segue into the, the next thing that I'm going to say that is on the record, right? And so, what I just said, not necessarily on the exam. Something to think about if, you, if you're up late at night. Um, maybe we'll just keep you up even later. But um, what you do have control over, and this is why I went off on that crazy tangent, is digital technique. Digital technique. And I guarantee you, if you have a technologist who's older than 40 years old, they have no clue what they're talking about in terms of technique. And that's what we're going to spend pretty much the next six months discovering, right? Is that everything that they've been told is wrong. There was a huge paradigm shift with the rollout of digital, and none of them took the time to learn it. And I can say that because I am just as guilty as them. And honestly, it wasn't until I came to the college and started doing a lot of reading and a lot of research that it finally became very clear to me how digital actually works and the promise that it has for reducing patient technique. We can significantly increase KVP with the digital system, right? We can increase KVP, which allows us to significantly reduce mass and get the exact same picture. So we can get a beautiful picture at a reduced patient exposure using digital. But like Allie was saying, these technologists, there's a sociological phenomena where techs are still using film technique to shoot digital images, and they're just consistently overexposing the patient. And when I say overexposing the patient, two times, four times, ten times, maybe even upwards of 20 times what these patients need to be receiving in order to get a radiograph. So we're going to be exploring that quite a bit. And it is a very, what, what I'm talking about is a very disruptive discussion, right? You're going to have a lot of people who will fight you on this, but it is an important discussion for us to be having because it directly impacts patient care. So what you're receiving now are just kind of the fundamentals, the actual, like just the base terminology for it, right? The significance of digital imaging. But here are some general ways that we can reduce patient dose. And of these, I think we can just, again, look at this, even on this slide from the textbook, Use fast screens. That's out. Right? We're not using screens anymore. That's film. But what is in is this. High KVP, low mass. High KVP, low mass. If you forget everything else that I said today, remember that. We can position the patients in ways that avoid gonadal exposure. And we can employ lead shielding. Here is what uh, gonadal shielding may look like. Um, And on page uh, 575, 
In box uh, 37.1, we have a discussion of when gonadal shielding should be employed. Bear in mind this is institution specific, so different facilities that you work at will have different rules for gonadal shielding. But um, this, I, I like these provisions on gonadal shielding. We can use contact shields. We can use like a shadow shield. Um, we can use these crazy like heel insert cup things. I don't know. I've never used those, but... Um, I had a OR physician who hated wearing shields, right? Because he he was he sweat so much while he was doing these oper like orthopedic surgeries and stuff. So I just we had this gonadal shield that looked like a fig leaf. We called it the fig leaf. One day in the OR, I gave him the thyroid shield and the fig leaf, and he literally wore it. <laughs> he loved. It. All right, and then of course I feel like we've talked about this quite a, quite a bit, but. Um, you know, these are the radiation exposure provisions for, uh, for the pregnant patient. Um, and the, one of the big takeaways from the book on uh, this is 569, this penguin box at the top of the page on the right, um, the genetically significant dose, a GSD, is the gonadal dose that if it was received by every member of the population would produce the total genetic effect on the population as the sum of the individual doses actually received. And we, we do have a, a, a GSD um, for human populations. We don't need to memorize those numbers or anything, but it is an actual number that we have that is uh, a genetically significant dose. Okay, switching gears just a little bit, let's talk about our own exposure. And um, kind of the last page of this chapter, you'll see a chart that will probably by the end of your time here at Baptist be seared into your mind. This is the NCRP report 160 chart. Um, they produced a lot of charts in that report. It's a, it's a huge report. And it was probably, in terms of my practice of x-ray, one of the most revolutionary things that occurred in healthcare was the release of NCRP report number 160. I had no clue that it was that significant, but it changed everything that we were doing. Um, and the reason why is because of the size of the, of the pie piece, right, related to medical imaging, and specifically CT, medical imaging in general. So what we have is a pie here, and one side of the pie is the natural radiation exposure. The other side is artificial radiation exposure. This data was from 2006, and so half of the a U.S. citizen's average dose, right, half of it came from Mother Nature, the other half of it came pretty much from medical imaging, right? Um, and of those, the only thing that has CT scanning beat is radon exposure. So the general public doesn't understand this, but 37% of their average dose comes from radon-222, right? It's exposing every one of us, possibly even now as we're sitting here. Um, but what's crazy about CT and the CT dose is that um, CT actually, the average dose related to CT was more than the average dose related to radiation therapy. That kind of blows my mind a little bit when you think about, like, you're giving them enough radiation to kill cancer and possibly even kill them, and CT beat you out. That's crazy. CT changed everything with the way that we do diagnosis. So, but the big, the big point here is that whenever we talk about ALARA, the there's kind of two big takeaways here. Number one, we're talking about minimizing risk. We just want to minimize our risk. And that's true with any good investor, right? Minimize your risk, maximize your profit. We're doing the exact same game that they're doing like on Wall Street. Minimize your risk, maximize your profit from the use of this stuff. And everything that we do is based on dose limits that are modeled on that principle, right? And the way that we draw that model of minimizing risk looks like this, right? Does anyone remember what that is? Linear non-threshold dose model, right? A linear non-threshold dose model, sometimes also called LNT. This is what Alara looks like from the standpoint of a scientist. Any amount of exposure to this stuff presents some amount of risk, so I want my doses to be as low as reasonably achievable. This is now a legally binding term, too. 
And we'll talk about this some more when we talk about ethics and legality, medical legal stuff. In the past, we could say things like, um, uh, how did it go? Let the master respond. Has anyone ever heard that legal term? Um, Respondeat superior is the fancy Latin version of it. It means if an x-ray tech screws up, the doctor is going to be paying the lawsuit. Right? That used to be the case. Not anymore. There's potential that if you don't understand this is a legal matter, um, it might be you paying that lawsuit. So, but in terms of um, preventing your risk for yourself, this is something we'll actually do an experiment on this. The lead apron isn't stopping jack, right? Um, it is able to stop, and so you all learned about half value layers. And this is why I was willing to risk my back, right, to wear the 0.5 millimeter lead apron versus the 2.5, the 0.25, right? So if you have a 0.5, grab the 0.5. If there's a 100, grab the or, or grab the uh, the one millimeter. Its weight is going to be significantly more, right? But it has a it can attenuate 75 percent of 100 kvp photons, right? Whereas the 2, 0.25 is only 50%. Why is that? Well, because of half value layers. We talked about that there's a decay constant here. So the thicker you can get that lead apron, the higher energy photon it's gonna be able to stop, right? Why do I say the lead aprons aren't doing jack then? These are photons that came as a form of patient scatter. So my number one occupational exposure is the patient. It's an x-ray photon hitting the patient then bouncing off and hitting me, right? That's all the lead aprons are designed to stop. They are not designed to stop the primary beam. I can't say that enough. A lead apron cannot stop the primary beam. It can stop a scattered photon 75% of the time. So we've established dose limits. Now, one thing that I've said is that what we're trying to do is mix, minimize risk, max, maximize benefit. So one way to think about it is I'm not trying to get 50 millisieverts every year. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to top off the gas tank on, on radiation exposures, right? Like, oh, almost got the 50 millisieverts. Let me get one more chest x-ray in, and I'll have that 50 millisieverts I was going for, right? I want to keep it well, well, well below these limits. These are limits that are established as if something's going on, if they've hit this limit, something's wrong. The whole system's wrong. Like, they take down the man and everyone with them. Um, so, these dose limits were established. I think they could be significantly lower than this. But these are numbers just to go ahead and memorize. Right? If you don't memorize them now, you can go ahead and not memorize them now and not do well on the test now, but guess what? You'll have to memorize them next fall, and so you might as well memorize them now. All these numbers here are worth memorizing. Forget about the millirem, because these units are out. All I want is the sieverts, right? Forget about the millirem. I just want the millisievert measurements. 50 millisieverts, 150 millisieverts, 500 uh, millisieverts with a cumulative a whole body of 10 millisieverts, and that's like 10 millisieverts times the person's age. So if I want to figure out what someone's cumulative dose can be, I'm going to take their age and multiply it by 10 millisieverts. And that's the max dose that they can have received cumulatively in the pregnancy information. Slide. These guys are your friend, but they're not going to stop. Again, they don't stop Jack, right? All they do is tell you, like two months later, oh, you were exposed to too much radiation, so stop doing whatever you're doing for the last two months, right? Well, thanks. It would have been nice to know that, you know, 60 days ago. Um, but they manufacture these for all sorts of different purposes. It has a very similar crystal to it, in it that we use in, the, in CR systems. They're very sensitive to different types of exposures. And just know we call them OSLs. They're what you're wearing right now. And we will learn more about them in, uh, in uh, radiation uh, biology. 
Um, you don't need to learn anything about TLDs. I don't care about film badge. This Landauer thing is probably anything you will ever use will be this, right? So there's, we only need to focus on this, but we need to know it backwards and front. 